to welcome you to the worship services of the Southern Hills Church of Christ. at 7 p.m. 
It will be on Zoom, so further information is going to come. And, you know, guys, keep in mind this is 2020. We're keeping our vision going. Uh, we love God. We love others and we serve others. And hopefully this is a way for us to still do it even during these times. If you'll bow with me, we'll go to our Father in prayer. Dear Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this day. We, we miss the times we have here in church. We, we hope this ends soon. We pray that you'll be with the leaders, that they will all work together, not just here in the U.S., but across the world. Be with those who are struggling with the loss of a loved one during these times. It's, it's definitely trying not being able to gather together for these memorials. Be with those who are sick. Please help get them back to 100%. And we thank you for everything you've blessed us with. Please be with the elders and the preachers here as they're trying to make everything work smoother and smoother as we go along. We thank you for the time that we've had doing this and learning from this. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.
be talking about preparation for the Lord's Supper. Um, some of you may wonder how you prepare. I'll tell you this morning, uh, one of our elder members, uh, Kirk Talley, posted a video last night um, about, he, about how he prepares. And so uh, I saw that as an opportunity to prepare myself and grab a pen and paper. Um, a lot of what he talked about uh, comes from 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 20 through 24. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a pandemic, if you're like Vegas, Vegas and Bell Stewart uh, and having a baby, if you're just trying to get out the door with the kids, uh, there's a lot of preparation that goes into play. And you're not always ready for it, but there is one thing we can be ready for, and that is his return. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now we will take the bread in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to come together. Thank you for the resources and tools used for all of us to worship with you this morning. As we take this bread, we will remember the great sacrifice you made with your body. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. same manner we partake the wine in remembrance of his blood that was shown on the cross. Shall we pray? God, we come before you again thanking you for your ultimate sacrifice that was made. As we take the blood, we ask that you just watch over us throughout this week as we continue to praise you. In his name we pray. now concludes the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you would like to make a contribution, we have tools online uh, through the church website. You can visit. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise to God. Yeah.
And he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do not love the world for the things in the world, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing all away along with its desires, but whosoever does, the will of God abides forever. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. Thank you for turning on your computer or your phone and uh, being with us today as the church, meeting in separate places, but still unified as the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you so much for all that you're doing to uh, get this thing out of the way. Uh, I know it's a hassle, kind of staying at home, maybe going to town in a mask, wearing gloves, uh, but I'm confident that in time, God's going to take this scourge away from us, and we'll be able to come back together once again and enjoy one another's company. That's right. In the uh, opening words to Queen's biggest hit song, Freddie Mercury sings, Is this the real life, or is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes. Look up to the skies and see. I think John would say amen to that. That John would say, Freddie, you're looking in the right place if you want to find real life. You've got to raise your gaze to heaven and see the source of real life. Today we're going to begin a new sermon series on the little book of 1 John, a series that I'm calling Real Life. You know, the world tempts us to look around and see what it calls real life, to see its definition. John wants us to look up to the one who is the source of real life. John writes this little letter to a group of people, a church that he's deeply in love with. And he's very concerned for this group of people, but you're not going to find rebuke in this letter like Paul would write to the church in Corinth. He's deeply concerned, but he doesn't send them a letter of warning like Paul did with the churches of Galatia. John writes with a certain confidence that the people to whom he's writing are going to change their behaviors as they need to. That they're going to receive the message and make the changes. Now the church that John is writing to is facing a certain danger, a danger that strikes at the very heart of the gospel. And folks, we, the church of today, we're faced with the very same problem, the same danger. And this danger has to do with real life. What is real life? What does it mean? How do we get it? That's what we're here to find out together as the church in this little book of 1 John. Well, the real life John talks about is not natural, biological life. How do you know when someone is biologically alive? I'm no doctor. 
And I haven't even played one on TV, but I'm assuming that real biological life means that the brain is sending electrical commands to the rest of the body, that the lungs are breathing air, that the heart is pumping blood. That is not the life that John's talking about. We might call it really living. More than just having a pulse, it's, it's understanding what life is about, knowing the purpose and the meaning of life. It's having the kind of life that all of us have been wired by God to desire. It's a life of peace and contentment and joy, a life of fulfillment. And John has a name for this kind of life. He calls it eternal life. And we need to understand that eternal life for John is not something that we receive as a, a gift when we die. No, this is something we can have today. Something we have right now if we are in Christ Jesus. We have eternal life now. And that life will never end. Eternal life. John is convinced that life, eternal life, real life, is found only in Jesus. But you and I both know that there's competition out there, isn't there? That there are outside forces claiming that real life is to be found elsewhere. John also has a term for that competition. He calls it the world. We might call it the culture. Let's think about our culture for a little bit. First of all, we need to see that our culture is so much a part of who we are that we don't even realize it. What our culture assumes about life and success and value are so deeply ingrained in us already that we don't even realize where we got those assumptions. Well, they came from the culture. We think it's just the way things are. So culture's sneaky in that way. Culture will worm its way into your life without you realizing. Culture is the water we swim in. It's the air that we breathe. But what are the valuable things in our culture? Number one, I think we would all agree, is beauty. I mean, if you're like me, just average looking, or perhaps worse, your value in the culture drops a little bit, doesn't it? And we might as well face it, there is a perceived difference between men and women. I'm told that a man will stop trying to be handsome somewhere in his mid-twenties, that that is really not that big a deal to him. But for women, it's a lifelong thing, isn't it? You've got to look good all the time because that is the primary means for measuring your worth in our culture. In our culture, if you're beautiful, you're considered valuable. Number two is intelligence. If you're not beautiful and you have smarts, well, you still have great value to our culture. If you can gather and retain vast amounts of information, you have high worth in our culture. People will come to you for answers to their questions. And doesn't that feel great to have the, the right answers to people's questions? Now, the converse of that is to be a person of average or below average intelligence. It's a great insult to be called stupid, idiot, moron. Many of us have ch painful childhood memories around one of those names. We did something, and somebody said, well, that was stupid or dumb. And to this day, that, that memory haunts us. It hurts to be called stupid. But if you're not beautiful, you're not intelligent, you can still have value in our culture if you have, number three, wealth. In our day and time, people who have money are valued much more highly than those who are poor or of average income. But if you're not beautiful, intelligent, or wealthy, then what do you do? Well, there's one more way to be seen as valuable, and that is if you have talent. Maybe it's athletic talent. If you're a better than average athlete, you can be ugly as mud and dumber than dirt. Poor as a church mouse, and you still have value in our culture. Or maybe it's the, the, uh, the talent of art. You're someone who can paint or write poetry or dance, sing, 
or act. I mean, I know actors, and you do too, who are really not all that good looking, really not all that smart, and they may have come from the poor side of town, but because they're really good at pretending to be someone else, they have great value. And so this is how our culture measures value and worth. Are you good looking? Are you smart? Are you rich? Are you talented? And if you are, you have value. If you're not, well, what good are you? Now, I want you to understand this morning, I'm not condemning those four things at all. We should always try to look our best. Practice good hygiene, especially in this day and time. And we should never stop learning. We should always want to know more, especially when it comes to the things of God's Word. Money, of course, is a necessity of life. We use it to pay our way. And we use it to spread the gospel. And talent, i got to tell you, we've got some good singers here this morning. I hope you can hear them on our feet. I'm praying that you can. We have some good singers. I love listening to people who know how to sing. I love people who know how to paint. I think of Bob Jewell and Jody Raven. I enjoy watching some of our young guys play football. So these are good things. But no matter how good they are at church, none of them bring life. They don't give real life. Now, they look like they do. And that's why it's so easy to get drawn into the worldly way of thinking, to see value the way culture sees it. Let's think more deeply about these four things. Beauty, well, beauty doesn't last, does it? We, we try to make it last. We eat right. We exercise. We have cosmetic surgery. We see people on TV who've had so much Botox and nipping and tucking that we say, Stop! Please stop. But the truth is the sags and the bags and the wrinkles are going to come and the hair will turn gray or fall out or both. It's going to happen. Because beauty is here today, gone tomorrow. And intelligence, at least for me, is kind of like this. The more I know, the more I realize I don't know. The more educated I become, the more I'm aware of my ignorance. Because I found it's not possible to know everything. I know of one acclaimed Bible scholar here in town who knows his Bible inside and out, or used to, but today he may not know his name or even what day of the week it is. Wealth is wonderful. A lot of things to buy. But money can't buy you love. And money can't buy you life. Talent, well, over time, the athlete loses a step. Artists get the shakes. Dancers lose their moves. Actors get put out to pasture. Talent fades because nothing lasts forever. Or does it? See, John has some really good news for us this morning about real life. 1 John chapter 1, the letter begins like this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest for us. See, for John, life is not some... some Concept, some abstract thing just floating around the cosmos. John says that life is a person. Real life, eternal life, is the person of Jesus. And real life is found only in Him. Now, if you have your Bibles open, flip over to chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 11. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Listen to this verse, verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Jesus came 
And when he did, he brought an end to all that striving and competing and trying in some effort to find value. He ended all that. Because real life is not something you earn. Real life is a gift. It's someone you know. And we receive that gift from him. Now the danger that we talked about earlier comes to us in chapter 2. Look at verse 15 there where John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. I want to read those same verses to you from the message. The paraphrased version of Scripture, Eugene Peterson writes this, Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for God. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. And so there's this, this pushing and pulling, this tension between the world and Jesus. Asking us, what are we going to do? Where are you going to look to find real life? The world says that real life is the result of Getting what you want. And so the people of the world have this singular focus on getting everything they think they want. And when you live for yourself, you treat other people very poorly. The system of the world uses people, doesn't value people. The only value you have is making me happy. I use you to get what I want. People of the world are jealous of those who have what they want simply because they have it and you don't. And in that pursuit of getting what you want, you end up hating everybody who gets in your way because they're preventing you from getting what you want. Life as the world defines it. And the results of living this way are injustice toward others, jealousy, hatred, anger, that's the system of the world. Constant striving, competition, trying to get what I want. And into that world of injustice, jealousy, and hatred, Jesus came. Life came. John's Gospel, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. When you have Jesus, you have life to the full. And when you receive the life that Jesus gives, then you no longer need to use people to get it because you already have it. You don't have to be filled with jealousy and hatred for others because they have something you want. No, you already have it. When you have real life, you want to share it with others, not take it from others. The real life provided by Jesus enables us to serve others and to love others so that they too can have this kind of eternal life. Now last week in Bible class, we talked about a barrier that stands between us and life. We talked about it. I put up a brick wall. It's called sin. It's a barrier so big that you can't go around it, over it, under it, or through it. We don't have the power. We're stuck, and there's nothing we can do. And so Jesus did what we couldn't do. John gives us more great news. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Jesus Christ.
atonement, the propitiation that was read about earlier. The sacrifice of atonement for our sins, that's Jesus. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let's park it right there on that verse for just a minute. Into a world where all the values are messed up. Into this world of injustice and jealousy and hatred. Jesus shows up. Real life comes into that world. And he offers himself as the sacrifice for sin. Not just for our sin, but for everybody's sin. Jesus didn't just die for us. He died for everybody. He died so that everybody could have life. All the wrong in the world, Jesus came to make it right. And his rightness has broken down that barrier that stood between us and God. So that once again, we can be on the right side of God. Sin is a crime against God. And God's justice demands that sin be punished. And so Jesus took that punishment for sin in his body on the cross. And that became the means for atonement in his blood. This Wednesday's Passover. In the first Passover, the blood meant a lot. Death passed over that house. The church is the house of the blood of Jesus. And death passes over us. Because we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. His blood provides the atonement for our sins. The way to eternal life has been opened through Jesus. When you receive Jesus, all your sins are taken away by his atoning sacrifice. And that's all sin, past, present, future. They've been atoned. Baptism into the death of Jesus saves us from our sin. Baptism into the resurrection of Jesus gives us real life, renewed life, and eternal life that begins now and lasts forever. And once we have life, Jesus then teaches us how to live it. How to live life. We've been living in this culture of injustice and greed and hatred and jealousy, all these misplaced values and misunderstandings of what life is really all about. Jesus rescues us from that life and then shows us how to really live. Here's what it looks like. 1 John chapter 3 beginning in verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. The world has warped the thinking of humans. Jesus trains us to think differently. The selfish system of the culture is focused only on getting what humans want. Humans become slaves to their own selfishness. But when you receive Jesus, you begin a lifelong process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. Two points to remember from the lesson today. Here's the first one. The world says that real life is found in possessing beauty, intelligence, wealth, and talent. Jesus says, no. Watch how I do it. And he gives his life on the cross for others. He is where real life is found. He is what true love looks like. He's the way to life. Real life, according to Jesus, is not found in taking in, accumulating, possessing. No, real life is found in laying down. Jesus laid down his life to free us from sin so that now we can learn how to live a life of love. 
John puts it very simply in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. See, the system of the world is a lie. It's a deception. And ultimately, it only leads to frustration because, church, let's face it, we're never going to be pretty enough or smart enough or rich enough or talented enough. The way of the culture brings nothing but frustration and disappointment. And eventually disillusionment, hopelessness, and death. We get caught up in this cycle of just try harder, try harder, striving to lay hold of the good life. When all along, the good life is found in Jesus. He is the supplier of eternal life. He is the life that begins now and never ends. So don't be deceived, church family. If you have Jesus, you have life. Amen. Now let him teach you how to really live it. As we find joy and contentment in the eternal life he has given by his blood. In the middle of that song, Bohemian Rhapsody, the singer cries out, Galileo, Galileo, Figaro Magnifico. And most people think Freddie's paying homage to the 17th century astronomer. He's not. In ancient Latin, the phrase Galileo Figaro Magnifico means magnify the image of the Galilean. He's paying tribute to Christ. Sadly, those three words in a song are as close as Freddie Mercury ever got to having a relationship with Jesus. He chose the way of the world. And like most rock stars, he died young. Real life is only found in the Galilean. When we learn to live as he lived, his name will be magnified in our culture and in our world. Let's close with prayer. Father, now more than ever, we see how precious real life truly is. Father, we are surrounded by death on every side. We turn on the evening news and hear about people who are seemingly dropping like flies from the ravages of, of virus and disease and sin. Father, help us to drop the values of our culture, realizing that they only lead to frustration and disappointment and poor treatment of others. Father, help us to love you with everything we have and to love others more than we love ourselves. Father, show us that the true path to life comes by serving others just as Jesus did. He gave everything so we could have life. And so we thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. I wanted to let you know that uh, starting tomorrow, I think, if not tomorrow, then soon thereafter, we are going to be doing daily devotionals. Uh, we're probably going to kick that off with one of our shepherds, and then Kirk and I will take over from there, and there will be something on your Facebook every morning when you wake up in the morning, just a little three to five minute way to start your day. I hope you'll take advantage of that. Uh, grab your Bible and a cup of coffee, find your easy chair, that place where you can really kind of be alone and think about God and watch that devotional time, think about it, meditate on the words. We want to be in your lives as much as we can right now. Um, because frankly, I'm just speaking for me here, I feel so disconnected from you. And, and I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I want to be with you. 
But right now, this is how we're together. We go to Facebook. And I'm so thankful that we're in a day and age where we have these kinds of tools so we can stay connected. But understand that this is just for a while. That we're going to come back together in person as the body of Christ. And we're going to hug each other. We're going to love on each other. We're going to talk to each other, cry with each other, laugh with each other, celebrate. Because that's what church is. One another. I love you. And I long to see you. Scott Ellison, one of our shepherds, is now going to come and dismiss us in prayer. It's good to be with you today, sweet church. Uh, what a beautiful lesson, Jim. Thank you. Amen. Pointing towards Christ. Pointing towards the real life. As John mentioned in the announcements, we want you to know that we're going to be having a uh, Wednesday night Bible class on, at uh, 7 p.m. via Zoom. Um, I'm probably going to be online at about 6.30 to give everybody a chance to, if you've not communicated via Zoom before, um, give you a chance to log on and hopefully get some of the kinks worked out. But uh, we're excited about getting to see your face and getting to talk to each other and study God's Word and continue this beautiful study of that let's go to the Father in prayer. Father God, we love you so much. We're so thankful how you take care of us, Father, how you provide for us, how you show us what it means to truly live life as it was meant to be. Thank you for sending us Jesus. Thank you for sending that love and that life and that light into a world that's confused, into a world that's broken. Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to claim that life as our own by claiming the Lordship of your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we pray that you'd be with us. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a time filled with anxiety as we see people getting sick and tales of uh, people that can't be together because of this virus. Father, we pray that you, that you would um, defeat this virus, Father. Help this disease to pass so that we can be back together, Father, in person. Father, we thank you for the avenues that you have given us to be together. We thank you for the willingness of members of this church to, to step up and to reach out and to love, Father, and to serve through this. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we point others to Jesus. Father, help us to be salt and light. Help us to be your hands and your feet in this place. We love you. Be with us and bless us, Father. We pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today.